thank you for being here. So just that, just so you know, we have online interpreting and we also have subtitles, something that we started with on the previous period of sessions. Since this is a regional hearing and there are, there's no representation from the state, first, the civil society will have 30 minutes to speak. Please, I ask you all to introduce yourselves when you speak. And while you are not speaking, please mute your, phone, your microphones, but keep your cameras on. Afterwards, the representative of the OHCHR Mr. Guillermo Fernandez will have the floor for 10 minutes. Afterwards, the commission will have some space to ask questions and make comments. And afterwards, the civil society will have another 20 minutes before wrapping up the hearing. On your screen, you will see a timer. Please pay attention to it. I know sometimes when you're speaking, it's a bit difficult to pay attention to the time, but please pay attention to it. And in any case, I will try to let you know when, uh, before time runs up. So I will give the floor now to the civil society representatives. Welcome. Thank you very much. I am going to share my presentation. You can see it there. My name is Sonia Arisa. First of all, we would like to thank the commission, the commissioners, the rapporteurs, and the secretary for receiving us on this thematic hearing on reproductive health. We know that the commission has made efforts to promote um, the warranties for reproductive health, so it is a pleasure. We're very proud to be here to talk to you and also having expert Fernandez to show you the results of our research. Reproductive health is vital. We know that states have faced huge challenges, especially with regards to the provision of reproductive uh, services during this pandemic. But we also know that reproductive rights and the access to these health services cannot be suspended. They cannot uh, just be available sometimes. So states need to um, adopt concrete measures to make sure these services are always available. Our initiative started in 2020 after analyzing these statements of regional and global authorities on reproductive health. For example, resolution number one of this commission which mentioned, which addressed uh, reproductive health. And on our analysis, we saw there are specific recommendations to address the crisis. And we use these recommendations that we think that also appeared on the press release that, a uh, press release that was presented a bit afterwards and we appreciate it because we believe it supports the warranty of these rights. We've also been carrying out some monitoring. We will be presenting the results now. We observed nine countries of the region and their indicators that gave us quantitative and qualitative information. The idea was to um, demand accountability from the states on the access to reproductive health and find solutions for the obstacles in ensuring it. So we have created a landing page. You can visit it. There you will see the reports of each of the countries and a regional analysis on the results of this monitoring. Now, before presenting the results of each of the quest of the countries, I would like to talk about the difficulties we found with regards to access to information on each of these countries. The duties of transparency and accountability of the states continue not to be complied with, even th and it is important to um, access this information. 
Now on the general findings, I would like to say that the monitoring checked all the indicators on reproductive health. There was a 40% rise on mortality in, in, in mothers in some countries. There was also a rise of 30% on out of hospital deliveries during the pandemic and access gaps were exacerbated during the crisis. So it is urgent for states to take measures and to use the information we'll be providing on um, good practices to improve their response. Thank you very much. And now we will make the presentations on the countries. Good morning, everyone. Good, good morning, commissioners. My name is Tania Nava from uh, Catholics for the Right to Decide Bolivia. During the pandemic for COVID-19 in Bolivia, the reproductive health of women was not a concern for the state. I will show this real examples. This is the case of an Aymara woman. As many other pregnant persons, the pandemic found her without information and with a health system with ch which have many, many problems on a country with mother mortality rates, adolescent pregnancy and other issues on sexuality and reproduction are the highest in the region. When she was supposed to give birth, the rigid lockdown forced her to walk for 90 minutes from her house to the highest hospital. When she got there, she was told that now this was a COVID center. So after many hours, she found a midwife who finally cared for her, but not all women were as lucky as her. There's another case, the case of the Chiquitana indigenous women who were brutally abused or attacked by the mayor of their city because they demanded their maternity center to be kept as such in order to protect women from several rural communities that are far away from the city of Santa Cruz. In the urban areas, pregnant women, in order to get to hospital, they needed 150 US dollars to pay for their COVID test and then deliver their babies if there was space for them. Several women died at the door of these health centers. There's evidence that in Bolivia, from March to October 2020, the services for reproductive health were practically suspended. And in disregard for their, for their duties, both in rural and urban areas, this happens. So this is a human rights violation. The response of the state is still very precarious. And this leads to very unsafe conditions for women whose lives run risks, take run risks, both for pregnant women for the, and for those who are looking to interrupt their pregnancy, something no one has cared about. That is why we request the commission to urge the Bolivian state so that it will immediately implement an action plan on reproductive and sexual health because this is an essential service during COVID-19 by making sure that by sorry by protecting the life and the health of pregnant women because there's still a long way to go with the pandemic and gender-based inequalities are always left aside in this country and also the state should um, offer options for women to legally interrupt their pregnancies. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rosina Guerrero. I'm part of an organization called Promises based in Peru. The absence of care for sexual and reproductive health during the pandemic has had a serious impact on the health and the lives of women and girls in Peru. Even though there were 
sanitary or health guidelines that were issued on this. By June 2020, we could observe an increase of 12% with regards to maternity deaths in comparison to 2019. Unfortunately, this figure continued on the rise, even though this was reported to the authorities. And by the end of the 2020, the rise was of 45% in maternity deaths in comparison to 2019. This was only, this figure is, it was only overcome by what was reported eight years ago. And in 2021, we have recorded 92 maternity deaths which is much more than the 54 that were counted last year. Quality care during pregnancy and delivery were not offered. That is why we see a rise in the deliveries outside health centers on almost 60% in compared, compared to 2019. And in, um, sorry, home deliveries rose 54%. The main cause of maternity deaths in 2020, indirect, was COVID, which was 15% of, the, of these deaths. Now, healthcare that protects women and prevents death, one of these services is the legal interruption of pregnancy. There were problems to access it before the pandemic. Up to August of 2020, there had been a reduction of up to 63% of six of therapeutic abor uh, abortions. And even though there was a health order that included access to therapeutic abortions to women with COVID-19, gender-based violence was exacerbated during 2020 and 1,181 girls of under 14 years old became mothers. Every day, four of these girls become mothers. Out of them, 26 of these girls were under 10 years old. This is triple what it was in 2016. During almost four months, health services and violence services did not work. And the Ministry of women's 100 line was the uh, line that the state used for caring for women because calls rose notably during 2019 in 15 and 18%. Many of these situations, Madam Rapporteurs, were reported to the state on August and September. They were alerted about this but no one did anything about it. That is why we respectfully ask that through that for you to urge the Peruvian state to double down its efforts to ensure reproductive and sexual services in our country. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Veronica Vera. I'm from the Sarcona organization in Ecuador. I would like to share the reality of access to uh, obstetric emergencies and legal abortions in e Ecuador. Maria, a 39-year-old woman, had a miscarriage in 2020. She went to the closest health center I'm sorry. and they told her to go back home. Many years, days later, she felt pain and decided to go to the maternity center that was close to her house. But she was told to uh, request a consultation with a gynecologist. She couldn't get an appointment and was feeling more and more in pain. So with her family, they had to pay for a private consultation. They detected an infection in her uterus. Which was, which was a risk to her life. Now, this is not an isolated story. Attention to obstetric emergencies or care for them was greatly reduced during 2020. This does not mean that women did not need the care. It means that they were unable to access it on the public center, uh, a public system. In Ecuador, there were five orders that were issued to ensure access to health during the pandemic. Nevertheless, none of these recommendations included specific guidelines 
for caring for obstetric emergency, especially those related to abortions or miscarriages or to warranty access to legal abortions. That is why attention to legal abortions in Ecuador dropped about 69% between March and July 2020 in compared to the previous year. Nevertheless, even though in spite of all of these barriers to access legal abortions, during the pandemic, the criminalization of women did not stop in public health services. Between March and August of 2020, 17 women were denounced for having abortions in hospitals. Now, criminalizing women when there's less and less care, there's no access to contraception, more violence, of, uh, more sexual violence because of the lockdown and a greater amount of forced pregnancies. All of this is a violation to the human rights of women. That is why we request the commission to urge the Ecuadorian state to increase its recommendations for reproductive and sex, sex, uh, sexual health so that access and attention for legal abortions, therapeutic abortions and obstetric emergency care in its recommendations, we know that access to reproductive health saves lives of women and children every day. Hello, I am representing Brazil. What is happening in Brazil is already known, especially taking into consideration that this violence is promoting actions against gender equality, and this has an impact on the health of women and girls. Up to 2020, Brazil had 70% of maternal death related to COVID-19 in the world. But this dramatic reality is also seen through the history of a 10-year-old girl that was pregnant that wouldn't have access to legal abortion in 2020. She was in two of the situations foreseen by the law. She was raped and her life was at risk, but still the right was denied. After lots of pressure, public pressure, she got the legal authorization for the abortion, but she had to travel more than 1400 kilometers in the midst of the pandemic in order to have access to the procedure. If the peregrination of this girl was not enough, a former Bolsonaro's officer made the girl's information public and called upon people to go to the hospital to stop the procedure from happening. So the girl had to go into the hospital hiding in a car. She and the girl that was go and the doctor that was going to perform the abortion were insulted and this created great commotion in the country. One week after this episode, in the press, there were published some participation of the Ministry of Human Rights in this attempt to stop the abortion. And after that, the ministry decided to impose new restrictions on abortion in case of rape. Without a doubt, this new regulation was an authoritarian response to the victory of the human rights and female movements in the country, which had been able to articulate the resolution of this case. These facts show then how serious the anti-gender ideology interference is in health situations, especially with a health crisis. There are no perspectives for the pandemic to stop in the near future in Brazil, quite the contrary. And actually, sexual violence cases increased in 2020 and they are still high. Therefore, the Brazilian women need more and not less emergency care for reproductive health, including access to abortion. It is necessary then for the Brazilian state to take the responsibility of guaranteeing the right to health and to be called it's in, for, for all the attempts to stop access to services. This is a very important value for public policies. Thank you. Good morning. I am Alberto Romero. I am a member of the 
citizen group for the legalization of abortion in El Salvador. The response of the Salvadorian state before the COVID-19 pandemic did not take into account the specific needs of women, teenagers, and girls, and expressly decided to skip the specific needs of attention in reproductive and healthcare, especially given the lockdown that was very long. This approach generated important impacts in the access to rights of women and girls. Among them, a strong reduction of gynecological attention, which represented only 22% of the usual care. 494 girls were reported pregnant between 10 to 14 years old during 2020. The prenatal inscriptions were 74% compared to the previous year. The number of girls and teenagers between 10 and 19 years old, active users of contraceptive methods in the four months of lockdown went down 48% compared to the same month the last year. Likewise, the lockdown without a rights focus generated a lack of access to the justice system to report violent actions, which generated an impact in the lack of guarantee of women's rights. Among them, lack of access to the justice symptoms for the report and attention in case of sexual violence cases, 37 feminicides during the mandatory lockdown, known women that had obstetric emergencies during this year were reported for abortion or aggravated homicide in the hospitals where they were pursuing help. And this is a problem that is even worse in El Salvador because there is a law that penalizes or criminalizes abortion in every case, including forced pregnancies in girls and women who are raped. This is why we respectfully request the commission to recommend the state of El Salvador to review the attention protocols for women having access to public health services with obstetric problems or abortions so that they can guarantee the secrecy of the doctors complying with international standards so that women are not reported from public hospitals based on prejudices generated by the total criminalization of abortion. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Javiera Canales. I am the executive director of Miles Chile. In Chile, the access to reproductive and sexual health are in permanent risk, affecting mainly women and teenagers. And it's been worsening in the past year due to the pandemic, as the Honorable Commission already knew and the rapporteurship of Redesca. So this is the context that we are reporting. In the past few months, at least five batches of contraceptive pills of four different brands were distributed with errors in its composition and they were withdrawn by the Public Health Institute in Chile. According to official data, at least 270,000 blisters of different brands were distributed in public services and private pharmacies in the entire country. However, the most serious situation is with the contraceptive called Anulet CD because it is distributed among poor women that previously were in the fertility regulation program. At least 170 women contacted the corp our organization to receive psychosocial, sexual, and legal assistance. They were all forced to assume unplanned or forced pregnancies, which resulted in additional ways of violence and discrimination against them, including suicidal thoughts, depression, being forced to leave their studies, being fired from their jobs, for example, because women in Chile are usually in the more in the most risky jobs and many of them were not allowed to interrupt their pregnancies even though among what is permitted by law due to the 
current context. Likewise, and even though the health authorities sanctioned the laboratories without giving any sort of reparation for the women affected, we see how this shows how the Chilean state is not complying with international obligations. Therefore, we respectfully request the Honorable Commission to request information to the state about this and to issue a statement about how important it is to guarantee the access to contraceptive methods and also the access to legal interruption of pregnancies if the women affected need so. Moreover, we need for the state to take all the necessary prevention measures so that the same situations do not happen and also integral reparation measures according to mental health issues in order to mitigate the negative impacts in terms of the rights and the life projects of the women affected. And finally, a statement around the private companies producing contraceptive pills in Chile that need to obey social rights and also they need to comply with the international standards of November 1st of 2019. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Liliana Brasisca. I am the director of Mujer y Salud from Uruguay. In our country, we've already had serious consequences given the neglected social, um, I'm sorry, sexual and reproductive health and what happens with legal abortion during the pandemic. In this health emergency, the Ministry of Health sent a communication to all the organizations saying that sexual and reproductive health should be considered. And from the civil society, we sent the results on the monitoring on the fulfillment of the recommendations, SACROI, and all of these still were not able to stop the death of a teenager in the framework of legal interrupt legal abortion services. This teenager died in 2020, even though there was a legal abortion process and with her attending to hospital emergency room after having fever and pain. There are administrative investigations and legal investigations in place now. And for this and many other reasons, we request the commission to please recommend to the Uruguayan state to improve the mechanisms to inform the population about how the reproductive and health, reproductive and sexual health services work, including awareness and information campaigns to guarantee the right and correctly labeled budget in terms of abortion methods, treatment for STDs and HIV, and other necessary supplies related to reproductive and sexual health. And it is also very important for women, especially migrant and young women in gender-based violence situations, they need the information to be removed from those context. We need to review the legal termination of pregnancy law in order to improve the conditions for access and the universal coverage of these services so that the objection of conscious abusive use could be controlled and the restriction for migrant women that need to stay in the country for one year in order to have access to legal abortion. Finally, we need to strengthen the fiscalization capabilities of the health authorities in order to guarantee the effective fulfillment of the guides and protocols of reproductive and sexual health and the right operation of the mechanisms guaranteed by law with the correct sanctions for those professionals not complying with the law. This would improve the situation and the transparency and accountability mechanisms. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Cristina Rosero, legal advisor of a center in Colombia. This monitoring was done in Colombia. And even though in April 2020, the Ministry of Health declared essential the reproductive health centers and these services should be offered in the pandemic, in practice, 
women still see difficulties to have access to these services. The obstacles that existed before the pandemic were maintained and deepened. Health professionals did not recognize its essential character and put obstacles to its rendering. And in communities and rural areas, they were highly affected because of the closure to health centers and the impossibility to travel to other areas. And the lack of information of these also was increased, especially poor women had more difficulties to have access to prenatal controls for lack of transportation, which increased 2.6 the neonatal mortality. Also, contraceptive methods were not given in the same numbers as before, and consultant also was reduced in more than 20%. Also, there was a reduction in STDs and HIV tests. But the most important example of how these obstacles were deepened and new appeared was related to legal termination of pregnancy within the situations permitted. There was a reduction of 20% in the rendering of these services compared to the previous year with a 76% drop in the first level of attention of health, which truly affects women of lower resources and in rural areas. Before the pandemic, there were already structural obstacles, but during the pandemic, it was clear that not only they were not improved, but also deepened. According to all these, we need for the court to recommend the Colombian state to guarantee surveillance mechanisms that the health centers could recognize reproductive health services as essential that could really go through obstacles in a faster way in poor areas and in rural areas and also for migrant women and also to take into account good practices like adapting services to teleservices for health that could offer many possibilities to have safe access to services. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am Maite Carstanti from ELA, Argentina. We did the monitoring in Argentina. And today our presentation is related to information about reproductive and sexual health services in pandemic ties. We identified some good practices in access to information and some related challenges. In Argentina, the national state and several jurisdictions recognized the reproductive health services as essential during the pandemic and issued guidelines and recommendations to guarantee and facilitate the access to the services during the pandemic. These recommendations were especially focused on the legal termination of pregnancy and contraceptive methods. However, not all of the provinces adhere to these or generated their own guidelines. 17 of the 24 jurisdictions issued little or no information about the reproductive and sexual health services in the framework of the pandemic. This was worsened by the situation of the pandemic, and it was harder in some jurisdictions to apply all this. A good practice that we also identified was the strengthening of the care in reproductive and sexual health through different ways, for example, through the hotline that was strengthened during the pandemic, uh, where people could call and ask questions about the services or to inform about obstacles. In June 2020, there was a growth of 536% of telephonic consultations about legal interruption of pregnancy. However, this was partial. There was a lack of campaigns and dissemination of the care in terms of sexual um, reproductive health services. And also there was a lack of public information available both for the general society and healthcare professionals. Therefore, during the pandemic in Argentina, we see that our previous obstacles before the pandemic that still exist. Therefore, we need integral and sustained public policies guaranteeing access to services in the entire country, including the effective implementation of the new law for the legal termination of pregnancy. Thank you. Okay, I believe that with these, your presentations are over. And thank you very much for all the information.
and congratulations to all of you for the efforts of coordinating your actions in the, your own countries. Now I will give the floor to Guillermo Fernandez, representative of the OHCHR in Mexico. Good morning, Madam President, Vice President, Commissioners, Rapporteurs, Executive Secretary. I would like to greet you all and everyone who's here. It's an honor to be here with you as a representative in Mexico for the High Commissioner of the UN for Human Rights. I need to read a clause. I'm here to provide information in an informal way. I'm not under oath. I will speak about the situation of uh, sexual and reproductive health and its access in the region. None of this should be understood as an implicit or expressed renounce to the obligations of the UN based on the 1946 convention. Now, it's been a year since the pandemic began and we would like to um, to focus on the issues I will discuss briefly, but we would also like to provide the Commission with a document on these and other relevant issues like sexual pregnancy and adolescent pregnancy. Now, maternal mortality, based on the information that was provided on cases and functions of pregnant women with COVID, the countries with the highest deaths death rates were Mexico, Peru, Bolivia, and Dominican Republic. In Mexico, COVID-19 became the first cause of mother deaths, maternity deaths. And in 2021, it's been 48.4 of the total of the deaths. In Ecuador, 12.5 million services were not provided, especially sexual and reproductive health services. There was a 60% drop in the access to contraception. All this calls us to double our efforts to incorporate the access to rights as an access in the analysis to access uh, to build public policies for to reduce uh, maternity, maternity deaths even during a pandemic. Now, as a good practice, there was a guideline for the prevention and management of COVID-19 that was for indigenous people that was issued by government by Guatemala and recognizes the essential role of midwives, indigenous midwives, as service health providers in these in their communities. Now, interruption of pregnancy, the banning of abortion is especially an absolute banning, affects the rights of women. Now, the restriction on these rights is even greater in the context of an emergency like the pandemic. With no access to this, this is a risk for women and girls everywhere, but especially in rural communities. In Ecuador, we have documented how the absolute banning of abortion leads to the criminalization of women who are in jail and suffer obstetric emergencies and are unable to access health services. In Honduras, there's still a serious concern about the institutional obstacles, including the criminalization of abortion in all of its forms and a banning of contra emergency contraception even in cases of rape. In Colombia, there's still concern about a bill that looks to criminalize abortion that will allow health institutions to refuse access to uh, safe abortions or the safe interruption of pregnancy. And this is even more relevant during the pandemic because due to the comp to the lockdown, there has been very little access to contraception. There has been an increase of sexual violence against women and girls and a greater likelihood of unwanted pregnancies. And now finally, to conclude, the pandemic has had negative effects in 
the uh, provision of health care for women, teenagers, and girls, and the responsive states has been limited or even interrupted. The offices in the region of the High Commissioner for Human Rights appreciate the um, coordinated work with the Commission, and we believe that the reconstruction stage after the pandemic will call for collaboration to um, bring the public attention to the importance of sexual and reproductive rights of women and girls based on the inter-American standards and also the universal standards for the protection of human rights in order to urge states to make a greater effort to ensure acceptability, access and affordability of uh, the public health services, including victims of gender-based violence and protecting the, the rights of uh, health, uh, health providers. There should also be uh, more services for recent mothers. There should be contraception, antiretrovirals for HIV AIDS and contraceptive pills. This should allow the uh, public services to ensure access to uh, receive information and should use consistent messages that will help women and girls to make informed decisions, especially those who are isolated and cannot travel. Thank you very much again for allowing me to take place in this, uh, to take part in this important meeting. Thank you so much, Guillermo. And as always, it's wonderful, as you mentioned, to collaborate with the universal system, especially in times as these. So thank you so much. First of all, I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Margaret May McCauley as the Rapporteur for Women's Rights. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam President. I must apologize for being late this morning. I'm afraid I've been awake since 3 a.m. This, mor this morning. And um, my time seems to mix up. And the change of Margaret, time. can you hear me? Yes. And the change of time is worrisome. Please, please, Margaret, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, could you like, uh, we can, I, yeah, apparently there was a microphone on and we couldn't hear you. Well, um, um, what's a minute? I am. Um, Okay. Yes. Sorry about that because I'm connected to the permanent council and um, the the mic was on. Um, I'm I'm sorry to to also explain that I would have to leave early, but this matter is so so important and so serious and egregious. We keep on working on it, um, the rapporteurship and the inter interconnected uh, rapporteurships, um, because the situation of the backlashes, which we have been suffering in the rights of women, especially in their sexual reproductive health and rights, is, is very, very serious. And too many states are moving backwards from rights which had already been accepted for many years. And despite the strictures of, from the commission, the recommendations, the technical assistance and offer for more assistance and so on, we keep on being faced with backlashes um, from, from the, the, the states. Um, in relation to El Salvador, we have visited the country, we've spoken to various government members, we've spoken to Congress, we have sent recommendations repeatedly about the criminalization of women there. We, or, or we succeeded in some women being released, but it persists. 
And, and so we have our work really seriously cut out in this regard. And we're happy because the rapporteurship is a member of the platform um, um, against violence against women, which we uh, set up with the special rapporteur of the United Nations on violence against women and all the other independent regional women's, women's rights mechanism around the world to enable us, which, and, and to enable us to speak with one strong voice. And we have the, 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 the commitment of the Secretary General of the UN, of the United Nations, and of the European system, and uh, um, the um, Secretary General of the OAS has been informed about it, and they subscribe to assisting this platform so that we can work together and be far more effective by speaking not as separate small units, but as one huge organization platform, as it is called, and one voice on this issue. And we hope that that will be far more effective with the various states in the region um, to stop the backlash, to instill in them respect for the rights which women must have and an appreciation of the importance of women's sexual reproductive health, which is necessary for the continuance of humanity. And women have to be healthy in mind, body, and forgive the use of the word soul or emotions. So we have to get, have all the states understand this, this situation. And I thank you for bringing the information to us, which we will, of course, use, and pray that you will continue to send us information for our use whenever there's the slightest change in any of your situations in your respective states. Um, so I thank you again. And I know my learned uh, sisters, the president, first vice president, second vice president, will continue to watch these proceedings from me until you end, which unfortunately I cannot stay until the complete end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And I'm glad that you were able to be here at least for a little while. Now I will give the floor to the first Vice President, Commissioner Julissa Mantilla. Good morning, Madam President. I would like to greet our colleagues from the civil organizations and the UN representative, Guillermo Fernandez. I would like to make a little comment before the specific comments on the issue we are dealing with. This board, this new board is made up only by women. And this is historic because in the over 60 years of history of the commission, for the first time we have three women leading the commission. And I would like, I wanted to say this because this makes us reflect about how there's a hearing now about reproductive and sexual health that needs to be seen at, with this human rights approach and not as an issue or a problem that belongs only to women. And I wanted to say this because after listening to you all, I was thinking about the mortality or maternal deaths presented by the human representative. Thank you so much for that. I was thinking how many some time ago, the issue of maternal deaths was seen as an only health issue or an only female issue when these are violations as to the right to life. And I also wanted to remember how at the inter-American level, we already have standards that states need to take into account, not only after the Octavia Morillo 
case, but also after a series of statements issued by the court and the commission, for example, on resolution 12020, the commission makes specific resolutions for the case of women and sexual and reproductive health systems. And in its press releases, this was taken into account as well. And in the universal system, the general observation number 36 about from the Human Rights Committee, when it talks about the uh, termination of pregnancy, when it talks about abortion, it says that the measures that states take cannot force women to seek dangerous abortions. They cannot criminalize them. And legislations, not only legislations, but public policies and the other measures that are being implemented are putting these women at risk. And I also wanted to especially greet these organizations and the women who are here, the women you are representing, because it's hard enough to deal with these issues and to access reproductive and sexual health. It is usually difficult, but it's more difficult now during the pandemic. So I would like to remember that states have special mechanisms for certain groups and for women's and there's an obligation of prevention as we've said COVID could not be foreseen of course we could not foresee the dimensions of the pandemic but we did know that the issue of violence against women because violence against women pre-existed COVID this could have been foreseen. These situations could have been foreseen. And also the difficulties in accessing the termination of pregnancy and other services. So I wanted to remember that obligation states have. And finally, apart from all the information, maybe later, not now, but even though there have been some references to this, I want some information from the intersectionality point of view so that we can know about the situation of migrant women, human mobility, but also women with disabilities and older women as well and, what ha and everything that has to do with their sexual health. And finally, the issue of organizations. We have a rapporteur for advocates of human rights because women organizations and organizations that work on sexual and reproductive health are human rights advocates as well. So I wanted to know if there have been um, repercussions, violent repercussions for these advocates, because this is good for the commission to update its standards on the defense of human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Mantilla. Now I will give the floor to Flavia Piovesan. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning. I would like to affectionately greet this network of women. Thank you so much for your valuable contributions for the mapping you've presented, the methodology, the regional mapping you have shared. You have shared the specific realities of all of these nine countries. And also, I would like to greet Mr. Guillermo. Thank you so much for your contribution and for shedding light on the situation of Mexico and Guatemala with a wider outlook. I have three concerns and two questions. The first one is the issue of abortion. I remember that my dear colleague, Commissioner Margaret McCulloch, McCulloch um, I was with her in Salvador in December 2019, and Commissioner Margaret and I even went to listen to these women in jail, imprisoned women. Many of them were in prison for miscarriages, a dramatic situation that we were told by the uh, ombudsperson, um, the local representatives. And we saw more women who had had this experience of criminalization because in Salvador, there's an absolute banning. So they are accused of uh, aggravated 
murder, the same occurs in Honduras and the criminalization of abortion is a serious violation of human rights. So your presentation made that very clear. The illegality of abortion implies clandestinity and this implies insecurity and safety and this leads to the death of women. So there's a whole intersectional um, situation here that I think that was part of the December 19 report on um, the violations of uh, the rights of women and girls because this affects um, in an unequal, sorry, uh, specifically affects uh, indigenous women and women and girls in rural communities. So we have the commitment to shed light on the standards, to refine them, to fine tune them, to ensure the right to access reproductive sexual health as an essential urgent service because this has dramatic consequences in the life of women. So I'm deeply concerned about this. I'm enraged because states are uh, re de denying women access to basic services which lead to their deaths. Now, the second issue has to do with, um, with maternal deaths. This affects Brazil, 77% of maternal deaths in the world for COVID are occurring in Brazil. As Mr. Guillermo was telling us about Mexico as well, their situation is very serious and maternal death in 80% of the, case, the cases could have been avoided. So it's a dramatic situation over 40% with a 40% increase. And of course, the issue of violence, sexual violence against girls, adolescents, women within the context of the pandemic, the commission has seen a rise of about 30 or 40%. So my question first, my first question has to do with good practices. Is it possible in such a complex and dramatic situation, would it be possible to detect good practices as Mr. Guillermo was saying, in the case of Guatemala, with regards to indigenous women, have are there any visibilized or identified good practices? Because I think that we are uh, at a strategic position to shed light on these kinds of practices. Now, as a rapporteur for the LG LGBTI people, I would also like to have information, maybe not now, but later, about sexual rights, especially from the perspective of LGBTI persons. Of course, our rapporteurship uh, deals with cases of discrimination, and discrimination, especially against trans women. And the situation there is very serious. And also the issue of um, that, that there is, that there's no legal duty. I mean, doctors can actually refuse to practice abortions based on their religious beliefs. And this means that the state has the duty to ensure access to public policies, to uh, ensure all kinds of measures to, to ensure that these rights are complied with. I don't know if the interim executive secretary would like to say a few words. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to the representative of the OHCHR2. And I just would like to say that precisely in this period of sessions, the commission has passed guidelines with good practices in terms of the recommendations published in the report about the prevention of violence against girls and women in the region. 
the aim of this guide is to offer practical tools to be able to follow up more easily what is happening with those recommendations, but also focuses on practices that could become references so that other countries could move forward with public policies in order to take care of these serious situations that we are hearing today. Therefore, let me tell you also that we have a strategy very much focused on training, development of capabilities, and also we are planning high level conversations in some countries of the region so as to promote this conversation and to offer them with the tools and supplies that the Commission has been working with in the past four years on these matters. This is all. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Maria Claudia. Now I will give the floor to Soledad, the Redesca reporter. Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to greet you, the Vice President, the Interim Executive Secretary. This is a meeting of women. Also, I would like to greet Mr. Fernandez and I would like to say hello to all of the participants and I would like to thank you the opportunity for offering us and giving us this valuable information, which is of deep concern to us. And this is something that we've been working very closely, especially with the Rapporteur of Women's Rights. The pandemic has shed light on inequality and also on the systems with male violence and women invisibilization and many issues like obstetric violence and financial violence are quite invisible yet because many of the situations that you have just shared are related to the lack of financial independence of women. I have specific questions and also I have a comment on how the obligations of the states in the context of privatization are still obligations in terms of rights related to health, and this is also very important to consider. And my first question is, is there any legal process that you could share with us? Have you started any process or do you have any ruling about this matter? Then I wanted to hear a little bit more about this information that Mr. Fernandez offered in terms that the main cause of maternal death in Mexico is COVID-19. I would like to hear a little bit more if possible, because this is the case. So I would like if you have any information because with the commission we are working on this and this is actually a priority. And in terms of vaccines related to women's rights and the situations that you have told us about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Soledad. I feel totally represented by my colleagues' interventions. And I would like to thank you all for the information provided in this hearing, which is so relevant, especially because unfortunately, we need to keep on shedding light on gender-based violence. And as Ms. Mantilla said, this is not a new thing. This was there before and precisely this week. We had a case on forced sterilization in Peru. And once again, we could say that it is good to shed light on these type of situations, but this being on the press, especially in terms of the processes against former President Fujimori, but this has been in place for a long time. We've seen this happening in Colombia during the armed conflict, in Guatemala, in Mexico, in the US, in Canada, which actually created a commission to investigate violence against indigenous women. So this is not new, as, as Ms. Mantisha pointed out. So I would like to congratulate all of you for the information provided here. In my personal opinion, it is very important to receive accurate 
information about the different vulnerations and also good practices. I think it is also important to give visibility to good practices to disseminate them and then in terms of what Mr. Fernandez said about Guatemala, and I didn't know about this guide highlighting the work of midwives in indigenous populations. And I would like to know from you, are there good practices like in Argentina? We know that these good practices could have problems, but it's good not only to shed light on the violations, but also to know about good practices to invite other states to replicate them. And as the indigenous population or people's rapporteur, I would like to know whether there are any other good practices in terms of the linguistic and cultural aid for women in indigenous peoples in the region in the COVID context. Thank you very much. Now I will give you the floor back. Let me see my clock. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. I am Agustina Ramon Michel. I am a researcher in Argentina and a member of CLACAI. And in terms of the question by Ms. Mantisha, in terms of information, it was not easy to have access to that information, the information we presented first, because it was happening live. We carried out the monitoring in an ongoing situation. So it was a challenge for us as organization and also for the very own state. However, there were some hostile situations when we were requesting situation. This happened in Ecuador and in El Salvador, for example. And then in terms of the intersectionality, question by Commissioner Julissa in terms of age and access to reproductive and sexual health services. In our reports, we have this survey, but in also there are surveys made by the very own organizations because still today, the states do not have many of these indicators broken down by age, by ethnicity, by geographic location, therefore, we see how what is known as vital statistics or a health statistic still lack the legal approach or rights approach because it's very hard for us to know if there is a discriminatory impact or if some groups are being left aside if the information gathered is not broken down according to some factors specifically associated to disadvantaged groups. So this is something that we mentioned in our report too. For this hearing, we had to select some information and we truly thank you for your questions because this is also in our reports. Then in terms of the question by Commissioner Piovesan and also taken by Commissioner Urejola about good practices. For us, from the very beginning, it was important and we decided not only to identify obstacles, but also good practices, because we are all experiencing this moment. We all know that the health systems are going through a lot of stress. So the idea was not only to request accountability or show the obstacles, but also to portray the good practices adopted by some countries that could be used by others. An example of a good practice is, for example, the electronic prescription. Another good practice is to have first level attention available. For example, in Argentina, even before the legal interruption of pregnancy being approved, the abortions that were allowed due to rape, which are legal in many of the countries here, they allowed to carry out these abortions with misoprostol. And this was allowed by the WHO and also recommended due to its safety. So it was a good practice. And also to eliminate the need for a prescription, 
to have access to the emergency bill. This is an emergency bill for a specific re reason. It's an emergency. And there are no clinical nor security reasons to request a prescription. So this would be a good practice. This monitoring was hard for us to make this decision, but for clarity purposes, the focus of this study is centered on reproductive health service prenatal care, delivery care, access to contraceptive methods, and attention to abortions. There are other indicators that we took into account like HIV, but we decided to focus on this because we had several indicators because as we said, we knew it was going to be hard to have access to this information. Therefore, we worked in order to obtain systematic information because we knew that nobody else was doing this and we wanted to obtain hard quantitative and qualitative data to reflect all these. So other issues related to sexual and reproductive health were left out. Therefore, we had to prioritize some pieces of information. We would like to thank Mr. Fernandez for bringing maternal death numbers according to our monitoring. And let me insist, it is based on official sources in most cases. Eight out of nine of the countries here are suffering an increase in mortality. The paradigmatic case is Peru, 45% increase, but eight out of the nine countries suffer from this. Today, a piece will be published in some media and the title is Increase of Mortality, the Silent Impact. And this will take what Commissioner Orejola mentioned in terms of the silent impact. Well, actually, that's the title of the piece that will be published. We share that perspective too. And I am trying to answer all the questions or comments that were made. I don't know if you get the floor back or if we can go to the requests. In that case, we need uh, to show a presentation. No, you will continue now with your requests. And then I see that Mr. Fernandez would like the floor. So after you, I will give it to him. OK. So this monitoring was very clear to show the negative impact that we see in not paying attention or neglecting reproductive health. It is true that the pandemic took us all by surprise, but also there were previous experiences. For example, during the Ebola pandemic, reproductive health was neglected and the mortality and maternal mortality and morbidity went up a lot. And since we know how these services work, that's how the WHO and their very own commission talked about reproductive health as an essential service. Moreover, this study shows how important it is to have the rights approach, which is repeated and repeated as a mantra or an abstract comment, but it shows that there could be very specific results. For example, a limit for arbitrary requirements. If the public policy has as a goal to protect the rights, then how is it possible that they can request a negative COVID test in order to have access to my delivery when I'm in labor, right? So this rights approach is a tool in order to ask for the measures to be reasonable and to make sure that they are truly destined, these measures to protect rights. And also, as I mentioned, this study shows specific feasible measures and good practices that some states have adopted that could be an example or could be replicated by other states in this new stage that we are facing. And I will take the case of maternal death to be very specific. Dying because you are pregnant or because you are in your, the porperium, that is 
a violation to the right to life. Between 85 and 90 of the maternal deaths are avoidable with cost-effective measures. I mean, states can adopt them now in the midst of this serious situation. For example, they could fulfill their duty of giving information to pregnant women on complication signals, as simple as that. And also explaining to pregnant women how to be alert if they see signals to an obstetric emergency. Also making sure that health professionals have to obey secrecy. They cannot report women that go to their hospitals with incomplete abortions or obstetric emergencies because these would make women to stay away from hospitals. And also they need to decriminalize abortion which will have a direct impact on maternal death. The situation can keep on worsening and actually the estimations show that without measures taken, taken the situation could worsen. Therefore, we have some requests here that we would like to say to mention to the commission and we would like to mention them very quickly to improve the fulfillment of the obligation to offer information to us. It will be very important and it was very important when this commission talked about active transparency, meaning the obligation of healthcare professionals and state stakeholders in health systems to offer active and a transparent way information to women girls and people able to get pregnant, even when they're not explicitly requesting it. It's not that a woman goes and says, I want an abortion because I was raped. No, to offer a woman in a domestic violence situation, information about how she has the right to opt out for this. This active transparency was installed by this commission and the constitutional court in Colombia and for us it would be very good to strengthen this message again. Also it would be very good for this own commission to invite the states to issue guidelines to accommodate the reproductive health services to this new era of COVID, for example with telehealth strategies or enabling the different levels of the service to offer reproductive health services, the access to contraceptives. For example, they could give a number of contraceptives for several months to the people so that they don't have to go month after month there when there are circulation restrictions. Previous slide, please. Several states have declared the reproductive health service as an essential and urgent service, but there are cases in Brazil, for example, where this was not even done. And some others have made the statement, but it was just a symbolic statement and symbolic statements are not enough. So we want to be clear about, and we want accountability in terms of how the states are treating reproductive health services as essential services and then attending to specific needs, for example, migrant people. And this would imply breaking down the information to start working so that the statistics of the countries include variables such as status, age, etc., And also having reviewed the restrictive frameworks on abortion including legislation against abortion and the very own protocols, the protocols issued by the health ministries that, for example, only allow abortion in hospitals and not in health centers, or they limit the interruption of pregnancies out of hospital or the restriction for the use of sun meds. This is not related to the current evidence. We are going to send this request to the commissioners, including more information. And the piece that will be published today in Ojo Publico, which 
through a journalistic perspective summarizes this. And also we have our website, Salud Reproductiva y Vital, where you will find the reports of the nine countries that presented today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Agustina. On behalf of all the organizations, I would like to wrap this up. My name is Carmen Martinez from the Center for Reproductive Rights. I would like to greet all the commissioners and the RESCA rapporteur, the new board, and the representative from the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN. Throughout this hearing, we have presented the result of a process that was very thorough for research and monitoring in nine countries of the region that shows the impact of the pandemic in the access to reproductive health services, which was something that was quite restricted before the pandemic. As you have seen, the gravity of the situation has become worsened in, with regards to um, people who are in vulnerable positions. So the daily lives of women and girls have been disrupted, especially uh, older women, women with disability, women in poverty, the, the LGBTI population, um, the migrant population, people who are deprived of their freedom. And this affects their, um, their right to uh, access their actual rights. Now, even though men, many International organizations have issued recommendations to ensure access to reproductive health services. There is a lack of an adequate response by the states to ensure these rights. And also, there's a lack of measures that have been implemented to protect victims and survivors. So all these organizations who are part of CLACAI would like to express our deep concern about the lack of access to reproductive health because it endangers women and girls to gender-based violence, to maternal deaths, to unwanted pregnancy, to um, many other serious situations. Even though we have found good practices of public policies in order to sustain these services like telemedicine or um, including sexual uh, health services in primary care, this could be applied in all the states in the region. So everyone here appreciates this space and the opportunity to present this data, our findings and good practices. And we hope that this, uh, thanks to the um, greater means of this commission, we hope that this information will get to those who have the um, authority to implement actual policies that will uh, remedy this situation. So we urge the commission to actually urge the states to fulfill their, their duties as to reproductive and sexual health the lives of women and girls in the region are at risk. Reproductive health is vital and we need it now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much everyone for this presentation. Before wrapping up, this is out of script, but uh, there was a question asked to um, the High Commissioner's representative. So we will give the floor to Mr. Fernandez. Yes, thank you. At, in the beginning, I mentioned that we were, uh, we would provide a document with um, elaborated analysis of what I mentioned on my speech and other additional issues. So I won't go further into this, but with regards to that, for example, in the case of Mexico, the Secretariat for Health declared that sexual and reproductive health services, in particular during labor or pregnancy, are essential services that need to be um, maintained even during the pandemic. And then we see the rates. The maternal death rates. So that is part of the message. 
the pandemic has shown us something that was already there. The huge gaps, the inequalities. And I think that we should capitalize on something that the UN has been fostering. We shouldn't fall back into old practices. The, we should turn this crisis into an opportunity. And once this is not just a health problem, we will see more clearly its impact on poverty, on unemployment. There will, be, there will be so many more conflicts. States will be economically weakened and they will turn into public policies. And the UN has said, and not its most uh, progressive uh, agencies, but we cannot just be observers. We need to be part of these public policies. And this is something that I think is of the essence and should be considered as a window of opportunity to have an impact, especially with this regional point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guillermo. Um, your conclusion was the best conclusion possible for this hearing. Um, we cannot just be observers. All these agencies and organizations need to work to impact public policies. And of course, uh, civil society organizations are fundamental here, not just in reporting the violations to human rights, but also to point out good practices and collaborating for the post pandemic. I don't know if that will ever happen, but uh, the world has already changed, right? So we will have to recreate ourselves and not fall back into old practices. So congratulations again. Uh, also, we've been using the uh, feminine generic in Spanish, but of course, men were, uh, were, were helpful here as well. So we would like to thank you all men and women. We have a long way to go here. I would like to thank you so much. The systematization of the information was great. It was fundamental for us and you do very serious work. So thank you so much for all the information you have sent us and that you will send us. Thank you, Guillermo Fernandez. Your presence here was very important for us. Thank you all. And I hope you have a good day. And we will continue to work on this fundamental alliance for public policies in the region in terms of reproductive rights and gender-based violence. Thank you so much. Bye.